It says it's streaming live now. Yeah, here we are. We're streaming live. Hey, welcome everybody. Jefferson Glassy here, uh, your host for Planetary Gig Talk Live. Um, I'm the chief spiritual dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music. But as I like to say, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And I'm really excited to be able to have this conversation today uh, about protest and intentional songs, political songs, because they're so important. They're part of the fabric of, you know, really our, our country and, and what's important. And it's quite a time. I mean, I really think this is a, a perfect time to talk about, um, you know, what's going on now, you know, what maybe the hist little, the history of protest songs um, are and, and political songs and what's going on now. And we have a great panel of folks. First, I want to say hello to Elijah Wald. I met you at Blues Week, Augusta Heritage Center years ago. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you too, as well as great to see Sparky Rucker, mentor of many, many people, also met yeah. Sparky at Blues Week, uh, Augusta Heritage Center. My, my son, Max, took, took guitar lessons from you one of those years, I remember, and Sparky's been a, he's been walking the walk for a long time. Sparky, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks, Jefferson. Uh, yeah, you know, this, this, Augusta brought a lot of people together, didn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. they were some of our mentors yeah. were there as well. Yeah. And, you know, last but not least, bat and clean up, if you, if you will, uh, introduced to uh, this young man, performer by uh, Brian Weber. He's a Washington, D.C. person like me. Um, saw his fabulous TED Talk not too long ago. Human beatbox, Chris Styles Bacon. Yo. Hey, everyone. So great to be with you all, really. And, and I just also want to Give a shout out to Ray Zaragoza, uh, who was going to be here, and we had to reschedule this, and and she couldn't make it. But I really appreciate you know her being willing to have the conversation too, and because we do want to bring everybody in that we can to sort of focus on the the importance of these uh, songs and the, the role of music and and the arts and in culture in our body politic, if you will. So. Elijah, I, I uh, had interviewed you for Planetary Gig Talk Live, the podcast. I'm sorry, just not live, the podcast, uh, maybe a year or two ago. And you you told me a couple of things that made remarkable impressions on me. Um, you talked about uh, Woody Guthrie. We talked a little bit about that. You told me about his book, Bound for Glory, and that he was an excellent writer. And man, I just swallowed up that book, and it's... it's put me in a lot of different directions and you are a you know you're a, a musician and a and an author and and you know historian you know so much about the history and I just would would love to hear maybe you talk a little bit about the you know the history of protests and political songs or whatever you want to call them from your perspective and how that's you know how, how this trajectory is going up until now um yeah, just talk a little bit. Um, I mean, I think one thing that I'd really emphasize is that the way I think the way people use music to create community and to move things forward is much, much, much more important than what the words of the songs say. And I think that that's something that's a direction that things went a little weird in the 60s, because I mean, the tradition of Woody Guthrie or Pete Seeger, or a lot of those people was getting people together, getting them singing together, getting them feeling together, just getting them, you know, meeting other kinds of people and feeling a sort of community. And a lot of that was using songs where the lyrics weren't necessarily didactic. Um, it was about creating communities or about people are out on a picket line and it's cold. And singing is a way to keep yourself a little bit warmer. Or people are out on a picket line and people are attacking them. And it's a way of, you know, making them hear that they're the other people with them and breathing together. And 
there was this sort of other direction that happened in the 60s where some people became stars singing protest songs mm. and you ended up with a lot of people singing songs which i mean i started going to rallies in the 70s and people would get up and there'd be all these speakers who'd be lecturing at you and when i started going a singer would then come up and we'd all sing together and it was a relief from the lecture and then it reached a point where singers were getting up and it was just another kind of lecture, but they now had a guitar and they were singing at us rather than with us. Um, and so I've been really excited. One of the things that's really excited me is the honk festivals and the brass bands and the fact that now when you go out to a rally, there'll be a brass band with the leftist brass band and they don't have to be playing leftist brass they're making a lot of noise and it's fun and it keeps the energy level up. And I think we need to remember that, you know, that's what music does is it brings people together. It creates energy and that's much more important than the words. Wow. That's a great, great point. Uh, the underlying power of music, not just the words, but the spirit and the community. But do you mind saying one or two things about Woody Guthrie and what he did? I mean, I just, you know, traveling, hoboing around like a, probably millions of other people playing his guitar. This machine kills fascists written on his guitar. Well, I think it's really important with Woody Guthrie to remember that one of the things he did was he created this persona. And you, what we need to remember, I mean, Woody Guthrie was reading Darwin. He was reading Freud. He was a very, he was very, much constantly educating himself and he was sitting in a room with a typewriter and he was writing these songs and he was creating this idea of this guy who's just out there hoboing around with the people because he thought it was important for people to understand that kind of human communication and the fact that ideas happen everywhere and that the people he was meeting on the freight trains were just as interesting and just as intelligent and just as tuned in as anyone else and that we should listen to them. Um, but it was a form of communication. He wasn't just somebody who went out bumming around on the freight trains and the songs came to him out of thin air. Um, he was a complicated person of many parts. Um, you know, like Sparky, like I think any artist, I mean, like, you know, like the older guys, I mean, they were, these were people of many parts and it's very easy to turn them into a sort of cartoon character. Mm -hmm. Well, and so then Sparky, I mean, as I said, you've been walking the walk, a musician, storyteller, folklorist, historian um, for so long and, you know, came up a different path than some people, different path maybe than Woody Guthrie. And, uh, but, you know, how, what's your pers perspective on this? You know, how did it, how did it start for you? What were you doing? What have you seen as you've mm. come up through the years playing this music? Well, let's drop back and punt on this, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Music has always been the glue that brings a community together, be it in church, be it going off to war. Just think about from every, every major war, there's these songs that you associate with that, you know, don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me, or we did it before, we'll do it again. Um, the things of uh, you know going off to fight the Kaiser, going off to 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 defy Rome, and that's we're marching into the into the slaughter pen there in the arena, and we're singing as we go out to face the lions. I mean, it's always been music's been a thing that brings the courage. Because let me tell you something. In my young life, I started off being just a rock and roll doo-wop singer. You know, everybody dressing in the same J.C. Penney's shirt, you know, and working out some steps and what, and, you know, the doo-wop singing 
to learning to play guitar and playing playing a little bit of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, whatnot, to all of a sudden, I'm 11, 12 years old, I get invited to go down with my uncle and my cousin, J.R. Ross, Bonnie Ross, t to to uh, uh, the Highlander Center down in, down in uh, uh, oh, I'm spaced down the name of the little town now. And it's right in the middle of the Cold War, the duck and cover generation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you probably don't remember this, but you've probably read about it, Chris, where we were taught, like, here the siren goes off, and we jump down beside our desk and put our hand here, and I cover our neck. Like, that's going to make a difference. <laughs> You know, and, and so to the point of like being so frightened every time I, in the middle of the night, if I heard a, an ambulance going by, I immediately thought the Russians were attacking. And so I go down to this, to the Highlander Center, and there's Guy Carawan, who is the music director at that time of the Highlander Center. Now, we can talk about that later, but he's singing a song about Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Almogardo, talking about nuclear war and what are we going to do to survive and all of a sudden i thought oh wow a way to have a voice to fight back because if you can start singing to people and, and bringing them together then all of a sudden it's not just you out there facing the mob the clan the lions whatever whatever the and the music is what brings us all together and you don't have to know the words like elijah said but if you know the tune then somebody can make up words and all of a sudden the yep. people around them start singing those same words. And that's what happens as you're marching in these marches and on the picket line. That's how these songs came about. They just, it's almost like a, an implosion and there they are. And that's what happened to me going from rock and roll all of a sudden I thought, man, I can do more out there with the guitar by myself and singing these songs. And I know the times that we would cross KKK picket lines to go in to do a, to do a meeting, the singing together gave us the strength to know we could we could survive what was happening outside. Wow! I can, you know, I can do this this whole hour by myself. So <laughs> pull me out of this thing. I, there's just so much going on inside there. The older I get, the more is going on the canvas. <laughs> well, well, just a, a little bit, if you don't mind. About so you started when you were eleven or twelve, or you know, young. And you've been basically playing, playing out, playing. Yeah. Talk a little bit about you know that that trajectory again to use that word of um, played festivals, played all kinds of places. Well, because of meeting Guy Carawan, who took over from a brief stint by by Woody Guthrie. A lot of people don't know this that Woody Guthrie had been there at Highlander for a while, and it. it and Pete Seeger, and going backwards in time to Zilfia Horton. And Zilfia Horton hearing I'll Overcome being sung by those garment workers. For, I think South Carolina was where they came from, or Georgia. It was either South Carolina or Georgia coming up and saying, well, we sing this on the picket line. And then getting to know Pete Seeger better, and we were on the board of directors to sing out for about 15, 20 years. And one day we were sitting there talking. He said, well, you know... I had to change the words because I I thought we shall as opposed to I will was more inclusive and I you know you had to know Pete to love him because he, he was one of those kind of people I've got to make this a little bit I got to tweak it some and then Guy Carawan teaching that song to to Martin Luther King and and to and to uh, uh, Rosa Parks and all of a sudden driving away from Highlander, Martin Luther King says, boy, that song is still in my head. You know, that'd be a good song to, to kind of teach other people. Maybe that can be the song of the movement. And, and you just see it growing and growing. And that's what the people's music is all about. It's like finding ways to connect, even though you live in Chicago, you live in D.C., you live in Portland. But when we all get together, yeah, yeah, we, we're all feeling that same Thing. We've got to we've got to take control of our lives. We've got to run the run the ogre out of the people's house. Yeah. You know, it may be called the White House, but my my ancestors built that thing. Yeah, you know, it's my house. You get out of there. 
<laughs> if wow. I could, if I could just interject one very quick thing, because there's a word that we learned not to use when me and Sparky were getting into this thing. And I think it, it's a good thing to just pull it in for a minute, which is the word communist. Yeah. Because Woody Guthrie came east because he was a columnist for the Daily Worker. And Sparky will remember, I mean, there was a time when there were billboards all over the South right. showing Pete Seeger and Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King at Highlander uh, with uh, big lettering saying at the communist training camp. Right. Um, we we got to remember that, you know, th that was part of this history. And we were taught that that was an evil word. And, you know, socialism, we're being told again. And they're Everybody's using it being told, yeah. It. They're using it again and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to stamp everybody with those words. Well, those words have some good history as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So inspiring just listening to this. But, you know, I, I was really happy that, that Brian Weber told me about Chris Stiles because, you know, the new generation, I, that's who I believe in. That's who I want to listen to. And, and I kind of feel a little bit out of it in a way. You know, I was talking with some friends the other day and, you know, what protest music is there now? And they said, oh, my God, there's a lot, you know, yeah. and I look up and and I'm not listening to the radio the way like the way we used to. So maybe I'm just out of it and I'm on my own social media. But, you know, Chris, there's a whole generation of people and they're making songs about George Floyd and Ferguson and all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, I'm really curious about any perspective you have on this and and you know given the history where do you see you know your generation going what 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 are your thoughts about this it, it's really it's really interesting i mean of course people um are writing songs about um uh of course like people in my generation have been writing songs about things that are going on um current things that are going to haunt can you hear me okay yeah oh yeah okay cool so of course people are writing Things I remember when I remember when the rapper Lil Wayne wrote a song about um about what happened in um with the Hurricane Katrina and what was happening down in New Orleans where he was from. You know, what I'm saying you got songs like that happening, you know, and you got a song currently that's going down that um that that a rapper, a famous rapper right now, contemporary um name um name um the baby. He was he did a he did a song about like you know COVID and stuff like that. Um the the well not really the funny thing but the the interesting fascinating thing is that um these aren't going to be the songs that are going to be on the top 10 no. <laughs> you know what i'm saying because look this this one thing you got to uh, keep in mind is that all the folks who own the distribution channels they ain't black people you know what i'm saying they're not the rappers and they don't come from my community so protest songs that have to do with my community and, and like and like and like and like true issues that we are trying to like work on not even just black people, just like human issues stuff. Like they, in order to reach the masses in in that in that way that people have grown accustomed to reach to to um receiving and consuming their music, they have to go through all of these checkpoints, right? And so people might be the people that that probably on these checkpoints are like, oh nah, that's gonna mess up our paper. Um, let's not do that one. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? The good part is that we do have the internet. And with the internet, we could we could put our music and it could reach people. You know what I'm saying? We could we could be on Instagram, we could be on Facebook and stuff. Um, and there are some limitations there, like with musicians like um and DJs, you can't like really um play copywritten material on lives, on like Facebook, Instagram Live or whatever, because you receive a copyright strike and stuff. Um and you could get your and, and and they have the grounds to delete your account after that um as of october 1st of this year 2020 facebook and stuff like that so people are doing it <laughs> but it reaching the light of day like what like in the places where people are used to consuming the music that's another thing right there yeah how is how is the music i mean you say the internet i, I just don't even sort of know i mean there's you know, SoundCloud and all these things, yes. an account. And I mean, I, I try to listen, I try to pay attention, but it's, it's, it's just not, not easy and not easy really to know what in many ways, what your generation's doing. Cause you just see 
Taylor Swift on the, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yep, 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 and that's and that's and that's what the people who are like industry backed, so they have like the resources to be all in front of your face. You know what I'm saying? And so that that's where we that's where we have issues right there, right? And we've been having issues like that for years, especially as it pertains to hip hop, right? Like, um, like if I if I ask somebody, like like maybe maybe in your generation, um, like what do you know of hip hop? Then uh, and they might ring off certain things, or as a person who is responsible for um for being like a a, a cultural emissary of, of both hip hop and DC culture, I talk to people all around the world. I talk to people many generations, and usually after I do a show, people are like, "Wow, like I'm like I I finally understand more about hip hop, and I'm and now I'm like." Like, like their palate is now set to consume hip hop because they now understand like context and all this stuff. But usually, if we if I holler at folks from your generation, they'd be like, "Oh, hip hop is this, this, and this. Oh, vow music. Oh, it is vagabond music, right? You know." But um, but that's curation, and the curation is all about like the checkpoints once again, right? And um, and we've always had this this like. Hip hop has always been like Roy G. Biv. We have all these colors of the visible like spectrum, but they've only showed you the R and Roy G. Biv. They only show you red. You know what I'm saying? We've had at the same time that we had um that we had NWA that were talking about police brutality, but they were doing it in a in a way that was like really much like using a lot of profanity and just being like really like really abrasive, right? At the same time, you have that. You also have Kid and Play doing like some really lighthearted, like fun stuff, right? And then at the same time you had that, you had really political rap, like Public Enemy and Chuck D talking about things that I have and talking about racism and stuff in the early 90s. So, you know what I'm saying? We got, we got all this, but oftentimes it's curated like this. So if you go to SoundCloud, yeah, you could type in anybody and find them and stuff, but usually the people that you're going to see on front are going to be um, paid accounts and they usually have money and, you know, they're back to see that. Um, they're backed, you know what I'm saying? And so you're going to see them. They're going to be in the front of your face. So that that's a that's a new issue that we have to solve. It's like um, we have these open platforms, but how do you find out about something? You don't know. You don't know that Mauritania exists if you never heard about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? If you just grew up in, in a hood or whatever or just in, in the U.S. and you never heard about it, you don't even know it exists. You know what I'm saying? Like, just like these artists, you don't even know the artists exist until someone put you on and share it. So that's, that's, that's the issue that we are, um, that we're working on right now is like, how do we market ourselves, um, and, and, and reach everyone in a place on the internet where it's like oversaturated and, um, yeah, and anyone could just do something, you know? Yeah, Sparky, um, what, do you, what do you think about, or Elijah, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to quick say, I, I'm, I mean, I agree with absolutely everything that Chris just said, but I do, you know, I mean, Beyonce came forward about what was happening in New Orleans about Katrina. She made yeah. a really powerful video on that. Taylor Swift, who you just sort of said, oh, all I see is Taylor Swift. She just came out politically this year yeah, and has made some really strong political statements. Dave Chappelle did a great thing on George Floyd. I mean, it's true. You know, if we're thinking about blowing up and getting famous, the politics of getting up and blowing up and getting famous is one thing. But the fact of just getting the word out there in communities. Um, I mean, you know, the, the political singers of the 1960s who really made a difference, who really created the songs, were people like Sparky was talking about all over the South who were just, you know, adding words to songs and singing things together. And I mean, the most famous of them were people like Bernice Regan and Cordell Regan and the Freedom Singers. But I mean, those people were making much more effective political music, I would say, than the Bob Dylans and the people who became superstars out of that. And that's going to be true today, too. Huh. It's not about it's not just about blowing up. It's yes. about people in their communities. Right. And of course, you know, if we hadn't had mimeograph machines and uh, under, underground newspapers, we were able to get the word out to the people that needed to hear the word. Mm -hmm. And of course, like I said, all these 
secret meetings and, and, and rallies and whatnot. And the drum, as we, we used to call it, I guess we still call it that, but the, the drum sent word out all through the black community. I mean, it would it was going faster than 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 radio could do it sometimes, you know. And in the old days, and when I mean the old days, I'm talking medieval times and before, there was always the minstrel that went from community to community, bringing the news, bringing the newest broadside ballot, talking about what happened with King Richard on the Crusade, talking about, I mean, you know, it, that's how the how the news got spread was yeah. through the minstrels. You know, so it's uh, it's up to us. If we don't do our job, the world is doomed. <laughs> it's simple. Well, I'm I'm just so it's so interesting how we're talking about community, and in a way, also the difficulty of I don't know touching, capturing, getting out some of the community that I think it would be good if we had more of now. You know, um, people been out in the streets. This has been a pretty good year for people yeah. getting out in the streets and building a community. I've been yeah. really ex I mean, there's sure. a lot of bad stuff out there, but I've been really excited this year. It helps to have a focus for your anger. <laughs> because, I mean, I was in D.C. the night before the Women's March. Hmm. You know, I had been playing. I was doing some, some performing at some of the folk clubs around D.C. And I said, well, Rhonda... You know, we better we better hit the road or, you know, we got 500 mile drive. You know, we, we don't want to get stuck into traffic. And I had no idea it was going to be as big as it was. But I was seeing people walking around the day before carrying signs. And there's things that I don't want to say because I, I try not to be profane when I'm talking. I, I figure you can you can throw the dig out there without people coming up to kids ears. But but uh, there was this one woman carrying a sign walking down the street talking about the access Hollywood tape and how she felt about this yeah. person being able, getting ready to come in to profane the people's house. Yeah. But, and most of us in the 60s, 70s, you know, cause I'm, I feel like I'm still in this movement. I, you know, you know, my knees are bad, but I'm still out there doing what I can and trying to post things in little blurbs so you can see it on Facebook you know, making sure I got enough words to keep the words big and put it behind a color like a big bumper sticker. And all of my 5,000 followers tend to pass those things along. I, so I know I'm striking my blow, you know. And, uh, you know, probably right now they're building a second dossier on me, you know, like COINTELPRO did on me in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And, you know, so I feel like, I, you know, if I'm making them worried, I'm doing my job. Yeah, well, your, your mention of the Women's March strikes home. We went down there. That was an incredible weekend. That was Donald Trump's inauguration, and it was really kind of a dark day. And we went down to that Women's March and were just blown away by the yeah. seas of people who came out. And we felt, okay, we got this. But then we're in this roller coaster now, you know, up and down. George Floyd brought that same energy back that what happened much, there just much big at least where I, i'm in philadelphia and i mean after the george floyd thing there was a period of about two weeks you didn't even have to know where the demonstration was or when you just walk out your door and walk towards downtown and join the first march because there were people everywhere in the streets and i think a lot of i i haven't seen energy like that i think i think since the 60s yeah and i and I hope it keeps going, but it feels like a, you know, it's a young crowd. Yeah. It's a much blacker crowd than we got in the Women's March. I have to yep. say that. And well, I like seeing us all together again because yeah. that's how we did it in the 60s. It was everybody out there. And we're finally starting to do it again. These young white kids getting out there, putting their life on the line, too. I love it. I love seeing, hey, yeah. you know, you know, this is this is my brother. Yeah. You know, you know, we, we got to stop pull, putting ourselves in these little groups. That's, you know, this, the world is, is, is my responsibility. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, I like think I the, said before we went live, I figure if I pull my finger out of the dike, we're going to all drown. Hmm. So I got to stand, stand there and, and hold this thing back. It's, it's my job. 
Yeah, I think the pause of COVID gave us um, gave gave everyone the the lens and the opportunity to pay attention because because if this would have happened during another period of time, as it has happened like many times before, and we've seen the video, you know, what I'm saying the response hasn't been like that. But since COVID put us just at a standstill, everyone can notice it, and then it's spreading on social media. So so not about blowing up, but like yeah yeah, ideas do spread. You know, what I'm saying. Um, people are able to see this and everyone started responding. So it's just like that combination of this thing plus COVID, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Chris, have you seen a lot of, um, you have seen movement, I'm sure in your generation now with the political scene, George Floyd, everything else. I mean, what else, what else is happening? Where, where, what, what do you need us to do? How can we, how can we help? Well, I mean, of course, of course, we need to, um, of course, we all need to stay connected like Tetris, you know what I'm saying? Like, like um, generations before us and my generation, generation under, like we, we need to keep that. I feel like, I feel like sometimes our co- our country, like the United States becomes like a, a anti-intellectual, um, like, like, you know, coaching country because we're always trying to like take the, take the elders and push them away and be like, oh yeah, no, 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 he out of the game now. It's us, you know what I'm saying? But now we need to be connected because like. Because there's stuff that I mean, I mean, I still talk to my mom about stuff and like and and she still gives me some nuggets to this day. And I teach my mom new things, you know what I'm saying? So we should always uh, stay connected. So I guess I guess if we if we're all like um, connecting with each other, we're we're good. We're good to go. You know what I'm saying? Like you like 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 we're out here doing these things like this. And then you're like, oh, man, yo, they did that same thing in the 60s. Look, go like this. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Turn to the left. And you know what I'm saying? And I think I think it's a I think it's a good look. You will be hearing from me after this day. <laughs> Vamos. Let's go. Okay, Chris. You understand yes, sir. what I'm saying? You will be hearing from me. Oh man, yeah. I mean I would I would love to, man. I would love to. Yeah, well, you know, man, let me know too. We gotta we gotta I think there's a lot of people feeling this. This has been a a brutal time these last few years and right now with the virus that little thing in the air blowing in the wind you know man really forced us to i think you know recognize what we really value too and uh you know i do believe that you know music musicians artists you know can lead the way there um any other thoughts i mean it's such a good conversation but i'm just i'm curious to listen to you guys and see what you have to say one thing that has to happen and you know elijah brought this up remember this book elijah oh yeah (laughs) this came out of the 30s iww's hand handbook of songs and just i mean i got three or four different versions of that and then here's something that came out in the 70s 80s and it's just chance to use while you're on the picket line giving you ideas. And I remember we used wow. to take things like the Land of a Thousand Dances. Remember that song? We're going to march to freedom. Oh, yeah. You know, and you just add these words because once again, you got to tune. Everybody knows. Then you come up wow. with, the, with, with something that goes with, with the meat of that song. And all of a sudden, you got everybody singing it. You know, people say, "How'd you guys learn that song?" I learned it five minutes before you heard it. <laughs> wow! No, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> you see, you see, it's 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 like such a simple thing. But of course, for me, you know, what I'm saying it's like it's it's like a um, it, it just like it's just like discovering like a, a new fruit. It's like, oh, this joint is good. You know, what I'm saying. <laughs> Like, like for me, I'm like, yo, this is a brilliant idea. You take you 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 take the momentum off a really popular song right now, but you spoof it for the political movement yep. to, to disseminate yeah. information. Yeah, wow. I mean, the the thing Sparky was showing us, the IWW thing, they actually wrote a lot of songs to the Salvation Army songs because you could set up right down the street from where the Salvation Army band was playing and use them as your backup group. And just rock to them. And wow. so you would just sing political stuff over whatever they were playing. Yeah. No, I think, you know, they're all those things that are ways of bringing people in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a thing 
I mean, honestly, it's one of the things that scares me about the internet and all of this is that mm -hmm. it becomes, they call this thing a community, but a community is a lot of people being in the same room. And also a community is having to deal with people even when you may disagree with them. Yeah. And my problem with the internet is it creates a thing where if you're not happy with somebody, you can just push a button and they're not yeah. there anymore. And that's not how communities work. Communities work where when you've got a disagreement, you've got to work it through in the community and you have these people around who are helping you do that. And I feel like we're the internet is teaching us not to make communities. It's teaching us to form these tiny little groups where we can stop listening to anything we don't want to hear. And that mm. part of it scares me. Yeah, that's that that's that algorithm part right there. Like, oh yeah, I, I show you whatever you click on. You like oh, you like seeing that. I right, I'm gonna give you more of that. But at the at the same time, right, there are pros and cons with with, ev with everything, Absolutely. right? And and like and while we have while we have that that digital community right there, we could also have a, a huge community and we could be like talking to each other simultaneously. Like, like, OK, we're about to go out and do this thing. I'm I'm hitting. We got people from Richmond up here. We got Chicago people up in here. We got Detroit youngins up in here. We got, you know, what I'm saying and, and we could all be connected that the craziest examples I've seen of that stuff is like in Brazil using WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp. Yeah, it's sure. like um yeah. yo like man just like just like organizing using this using <clears throat> using whatsapp for protests like yo we we rolling um and then of course in china and hong kong in hong kong they they Absolutely. were doing the same thing and their their stuff what, what's happening in hong kong and how they were doing their protests it is very it's very admirable like the systems that they have in place like oh yeah they're doing the gas like and then they have like supply chains like in the protests like oh yeah we we're bringing these re resources they were kind of like ants with it you know like um so yeah at the same time we can't be in that space like that but it allows us to um to, to be a, a larger network you know absolutely no for bringing people out it's amazing yeah but but it, but but it's like it's like what you're touching on is a bit of um the algorithm stuff in addition to cancel culture you know what I'm saying? What's it? Oh, cancel culture. Yeah. Cancel culture, which um, which because of a mistake, a person cancels them, and there's no room for redemption. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, like it's just like, oh, nah, he's gone forever. He is canceled. Like he said one wrong thing. It's just like, oh, I'm sorry, I was hella ignorant about the joint. Like, nah, nah, now nah, you done. You know what I'm saying? And we need redemption too. You know what I'm saying? And that and that's the type of thing that you will that you will get in this communal space that you um that 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 you speak of, Elijah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay this dude did this but he's a part of the thing so we got to work this out somehow because we're gonna we got to walk down this thing together yeah well, we... i'm sorry no go ahead it's interesting you should say that because uh like so i'm 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 facebook's the only thing i do because you know it's all my folk right. friends are on there you know, I I, you know I, oh oh man he's dead you know <laughs> that's you know because it's something interesting now we're, we're so old it's like every week or so Oh, now Fred's gone, you know. But I said, well, who's coming to my funeral? But uh, I've got friends because the kind of music we play, sometimes we play at like bluegrass festivals too. We're the token folk on, uh, group that comes in. And a lot of those people are really right wing. I'll just be honest with you about it. Hmm. And, I've, you know, they love our music. And so they're also on my Facebook friends. And they're the ones that when one of my radical Marxist friends, which I've got tons of, posts something, then they come on and try to give the, the other side. And they say, well, why don't you just delete that guy? I said, well, how am I going to change him? If come, I, on. I come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's because they, they like me enough. They listen to me. <laughs> they may not agree with everything I say, but they like me enough that they'll listen to me. And that's the way you make the changes. You know, it it is evolution. It's not revolution. 
Man, yeah, I'm I'm with you three hundred percent. I mean, I got I got friends, right? I got I got friends who like like white, and then they're from like this place and other place, and they have family members, right? Like generation up and two generations up, and they just they just not about the same thing that they're about. Like as far as like seeing like oh no, people are people. They're cool people. They're not so cool people in every group, and but they but they quick to cancel their family members. And just hang out with us and over here i'm like nah don't cancel your family members yeah they love you talk to them yeah talk to them like 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 we we have to be we have to have non-judgmental conversations with people and and, and try to figure out what it is and you know what i'm saying why why are they this way and just and just educate them you know what i'm saying like we we need to hear each other and because um i think that's another thing that's happening in, in this era is like the divisiveness of media and of, of social media like giving you like just what you want to see and nothing else like we have we have we have a whole side of this um country just just paying attention to this this news network and then we have another side of the country doing this over here and then both are just doing nothing but just like um reinforcing your confirmation bias right yeah and the problem is we're not at, we're not at the same watering holes together to, yeah. to, to encounter each other and to learn about each other. So then that's when it just gets real tough because it's like, oh, I'm going to stay on that side forever and you stay on that side forever. And we never get a chance to figure this out, you know? Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I also noticed when we were getting out in the street, you know, there are class things also that get involved in all of this. I mean, hmm. along with the gender and the race and whatever. And I mean, <laughs> People who have more money, more middle class people, I come from that background, um, we're a lot more used to isolating ourselves. And it's a lot easier for us to shut people out. I mean, if you're living in a community where you have to depend on each other, it's a lot harder to shut people out. And I was noticing in the George Floyd protests you know, there was this moment that to me was really, I don't know, deep, let's say, where there's this woman, black woman, older woman speaking, and she was talking about her fear um, every day when her two grown sons go out and her daughter, who's a policewoman, and the worries about the three of them. And there's this young white kid in front of me holding up this sign saying, fuck the police. And I'm thinking, are you listening <laughs> to this woman? Because, I mean, you know, and I was noticing that, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter protesters, the Black Black Lives Matter protesters were kneeling with the police and trying to make some sort of communication because they have to deal with this in real life in their communities right. and they want to make a communication. And there were white kids who it's easy for them to just, you know, scream against this because they're not scared of the police. They don't have to deal with the police. It's an abstraction. And I think it's really important. It's one of the reasons I was really glad to see people out in the street, because when you're out there, at least for a moment, it stops being an abstraction. Yeah. Well, it's like that Kenosha kid, after he kills two people and wounds another, walks up to the police and they just wave at him. And he goes on by. If the if, if his face had been black, he would have been mown down on the streets of Kenosha. That would have been it. Just like the Black Panthers, you know, when they were trying to have the unloaded guns standing away from the police, reading the rights. Can you imagine if they tried to do that now? They'd be, they'd all been dead. It would have been more than just Fred Hampton that was murdered. You know, this is just so amazing. We're at such an inflection point. It seems to me anyway, I mean, things are just wild in so many different ways, but you know, here we are. And, and thanks to you for having a conversation about music, political songs, protest songs, intentional songs. I like to think of them that way. You know, here's, here's what I think about this, here's what I want to put out there. But it comes down to community and listening. Listening is so important in music. You know, maybe musicians are should be good at that anyway. I work on it, but 
you know, we may have to all get out. In the, you, you don't know what's going to happen the next month or couple months. We may have to really get out in the street. So what do you all think about, you know, what's next? What can we do? What can musicians do? Um, any thoughts? I mean, Sparky, I'm with you. I From this, this Hawaiian teaching of Ho'oponopono, I kind of take the perspective. Yeah, if there's a problem, it's my problem to fix. How am I going to do that? <laughs> it's a big problem. But, you know, together with the community, maybe we can make some progress and, you know, we can all all make little differences, like little, you know, a leaf falling in that water behind me. I've watched it many times, makes a big, you know, circle of rings of waves that go out like that. Do you have thoughts about all of you? What what can we do? What's What's coming up? What should we look for? What should we strive to do? What can we do better? Any thoughts like that? I know one thing, if the Supreme Court in November rules the way I think they're going to try to rule on the Affordable Care Act, my wife and my son are going to use their, lose their health care. And that scares the heck out of me. That scares the heck out of me. And I wish more people were paying attention to this. That's why the, the discussion we had before we started, those are the things you got to stay on top of. Is like make people realize, hey, you know, the down ballot races are just as important as a presidential race because these are the people that make the laws. These are the ones that, like the Tennessee governor, about, I'm going to say a month ago, just made a law that if you get arrested in a protest, it's going to be a felony and you're going to lose your right to vote. <laughs> oh, man. You know, he didn't try to hide that. It this is this is this is the law in Tennessee now. It's a tough time. I mean, it's the First Amendment. It's the very First Amendment in the Constitution, and this guy's threatening to take it away yeah. because you're exercising your right by by the Constitution of the United States. But can he even take that away because it's just baked in our Constitution already? It it well because he also controls the legislature. They've made a law saying that it's going to be a, a I think a fourth class felony, which will take away your right to vote. And he legally did this. Wow, people try too hard. <laughs> people <laughs> try too hard. I feel like I feel like this whole year is like trying trying too hard to come for people's um, health, their brightness, their happiness, their light. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's important for us to, um, even though times are hard, is to try to try to keep our light and to try to power up however we could power up. And so this goes to 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 what you're saying, Jefferson, sir. Like, um, is um, you know, musicians, if, if you feel if you feel called to write the right your the right these songs about the moment, write that song and get that joint out there. But if, if you if you're just not about that life because you're not that well informed and stuff like that, instead of misleading people, then, you know, write, write your song to lift people up, you know, what I'm saying to give people hope because we, we need to be up in this joint, like hammering away. But then we also need to unwind and get our party on, too. So so we need both. We need both classes and categories of, of musicians and of songs, partying and protest, you know, what I'm saying. And they don't um, have to be separate. You can do both. Hey. <laughs> well, like my concerts are like going to church. I mean, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I come from a long line of Church of God sanctified preachers, you know. And my daddy, by the way, was a cop. And wow. he, he was the one that gave me the talk about bad cops. Hmm. You know, so like, you know, that's that, like that, that dichotomy. Hey, man, no, I'm not saying shoot the cops. Because there's some good ones out there. Yeah, the good ones have to be the ones that police the bad ones. For That's sure. why you got to make sure you don't you don't put them all in the same basket because they're the mm -hmm. ones that can control them. But yeah, like one thing I I insist people sing with me. I say I want I want it to sound like it did in my my granddaddy's church. I want to hear everybody singing, and so I can, as as Rhonda says, go in there and Ray Charles up that song. You know, get the people singing, then you do that answer back thing Ray Charles did. Wow. Oh, yeah. So what I try to tell young kids in these music camps, if you're going to write a song, make sure other people can sing it besides you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Man, do you, go, do you come to D.C. much? Do you know Go-Go music? 
I do come to, but no, I don't know that. Tell me about it. So it, it's a it's a style of music. Yeah. It, it was it was just this year put in. Um, the, the mayor declared that the official music of D.C. As far as like just the people, it has always been the official music of D.C. But Go-Go is a, um, is a style of music created by this um, guy named Chuck Brown. It's like one, it's like a, it's like a type of beat. So it's like, like playing a marathon. Like the party starts at eight, ends at 10. This band is going to be playing from eight to 10. Like okay. without, without break, the music and just goes continuously. It goes and goes. But, um, but with its, key to go-go music is on um, percussion but call and response always with call and response so the audience always has a part to say like you know saying so you can sing along but then there's gonna be a, a place hey uh i say a southeast south southeast say what southeast so you know like things like this and so it, it makes it makes a really good like situation for um for for the crowd being one and just like these things that you're explaining i'm just like man this some this some go go stuff right here, <laughs> you know. Yeah, Where's I mean the, the thing you just said. Me? I mean that chant you just started chanting. You can put in anything there instead of southeast. Yeah. Yes. So say a George Floyd. What's that? George. Floyd. I mean whatever it is. Yes. Yeah. And that's what's interesting. If you're watching what's happening in another city on television, you hear the people marching by, and this little group is doing this thing, then. All of a sudden, here's another group doing another song and another chant and whatnot. It makes me feel good. I got to tell you, you know, I'm I, my glass is always half full. My wife says, don't you ever? And I said, but, you know, I always have to believe there's hope. <laughs> this is why I'm still going. I've got I've always got to believe I can make a difference. We, yeah. can, we can change this thing. If you know, if I if I if I become despondent, the world's in trouble. <laughs> I'm always optimistic about that we're going to work this thing out. Well, you can blame it on me if 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 something doesn't go right in this next election. I dang smart didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, we we all need to do our our part. You know, one thing we're we're trying here with our little planetary gig society is um, I mentioned this the last time we talked, but. Um, Concerts for Democracy coming up this weekend. We've got a few people, pre-recorded songs, protest political intentional songs. We're just going to put them out there. But it's really the uh, the bigger thought of it's not just a concert. Concerts, mm -hmm. like how about a million concerts between now and the next six months? Or you know what can we get out there and do? We we're, we're isolated in many ways and not together, but we also have this medium where you can touch people around the world. So, um, you know, I hope people will check that out, but uh, I'm looking forward to, I, I, I want to, I want to be marching down the street with you guys, really. Maybe you can push my wheelchair or something. You know? uh. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bad knee too. I may have to get in there every once in a while. Um, any other, any other final thoughts about, about this topic? I mean, it, it's just, there. The, the community that's drawn together through the music is so important and it just seems really a key time to kind of focus on that and do what we can to build that up. So, man, I hope anybody listening will take that to heart. As Chris Stiles says, you know, write down that song if you can, do whatever you can. Any other last thoughts? I do hope somebody's documenting what you guys are doing, Chris. I really, really do because like I said, here's, one of the books from the civil rights and here's another from the civil rights movement and all the wow. songs. Here's wow. something that came out about the mountain people's struggle. I mean, all these things I had, I had some connection with. Wow. You know, because it needs to be documented. We don't uh -huh. want to forget this thing because you guys are, are moving mountains. Thank God the reinforcement showed up. Thank you. Thank God. Yeah. Our reinforcement, man. <laughs> Look, look! I found this. I found this this discussion with you all to be very fruitful, and and I'm a, I'm gonna share this more with my channels and stuff like that. And, and I hope that we could um follow each other and keep sharing information. Yeah. It's like it's it's amazing. It's like um I don't know. It's it's, it's so fascinating because it's it's not really that many years separated. Like, nope. but you know, say it's it's crazy. It's just like yeah, I mean. We we need to be sharing the ideas back and forth because like yeah y'all seen y'all seen these things before it ain't new you know what I'm saying? Are you on Facebook? 
Yep, I'm on the Book of Faces. I'm on the Instantaneous Gram. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, all those things. James Sparky Rucker. All right, let me get it. Yeah, we'll we'll Bring me. we'll keep connected here too. Yeah. Elijah, any any further final words there? No, just pleased to be on this, listening to these gentlemen. This has been really great. It's good seeing you, man. I miss you. We 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 don't run into each other nearly as much as we used to. <laughs> No, I, though I'm in Philly now, I'm a little bit closer. So as soon as things clear up a little, I'm going to try to get down your way. All right, I'll come too. Chris, you in? What, the Philly? No, go he's down in... You, Phil, well, go see I'm Spanish. down in Knoxville. You're still in Knoxville, right, Sparky? Oh, you're there. I'm, I'm in an adjoining county. Oh, okay. man. See, I got to learn how to drive first. <laughs> well, I don't know how to for, drive. I'm like a DC head. Not for <laughs> Philly, you don't. Philly, Philly you just I'm get good. on the train. Yeah. yeah. No place to park. Why drive? You know. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I got a car, Chris. You come with me. Ah, uh, yeah. Go. You're in the. You're in DC, no? Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Born and bred in DC. Yeah. Wow. Let's go. And then, and then, Sparky, I see you already. You connected to my OG, Mitch, right there. There's Mr. a lot of people you may recognize if you if you have a few older folks. I got a lot of young people in mind too. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And they're the kids of, of my friends. <laughs> and, and you know, people listen. If if you want to catch up with any of any of us, and let's let's uh, uh, take that baton and keep passing it on, right? Yeah. Is there a way to post our websites on your site there? Oh yeah. Well, you, actually, that's a good idea. If you, everybody could just say what their their thing is, I'll I'll uh, put it in up. I'll put it on at some point. Or... Mine is SparkyAndRonda.com. It's all spelled out, Sparky and A and D Rhonda dot com. Okay. Yeah, she should have been on this panel too. Uh, it's true. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh. just ElijahWald.com. Just Elijah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I what's you got two people. I only got one. <laughs> <laughs> my uh my website is um it's chrystyles.com, but you could also type in progressivehiphop.com. And then you'll find me. Yeah. Hey, you know, maybe just to wrap up, can you? I mentioned human beatbox earlier. You got you got a little sound for us right here. Uh, let's see what things I'm doing. Oh, oh, y'all got to check out this series I got called Beatbox Remix. So what what I'm doing to connect people is um, just who don't even speak the same language. I'm using like my first instrument, the human beatbox, to collaborate with musicians that play traditional music from different countries. So cats okay. might not even speak the same language, but the music is coming together. And so if you go to beatboxremix.com, um, then you will catch these videos and stuff. Or type in beatbox remix, Chris Styles Bacon in YouTube, and you'll see that with Arab traditional music, Chinese music, all this stuff, Brazilian music. All right, here we go. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, I'm not from the suburbs, I'm picking this very much sick with it. Style, I do it on a twin with people that will pick up a rap style and pick your rap stamp and have you unwilling to rap now. I think fast and when I back down, for some stupid stuff, I'll play the back. Ground, cause styles represents the strongest Ella man from the south side. We call the continent. Yeah. <laughs> I Chris yeah another fan here, yeah, buddy. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Sparky Rucker, Elijah Wald, Chris Styles. Appreciate it very much. We'll see you all down the road. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you.